So what I would hope to do today is kind of go over uh, the syllabus, some basics, uh, and a little bit of the material that we're going to be going over through the semester. So a little bit of chapter one of the textbook. So let's see. Basic stuff. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? I'm not the PowerPoint, the PDF? Yes. Yes. yes? Okay, so everybody see the syllabus, all right. So basic stuff, uh, you can contact me uh, through my email address. There's also a phone number there. Uh, I have a voicemail box there that you can leave a message if you need to. Uh, also, if you need me throughout the semester, uh, I can schedule a one-to-one -one, Zoom conference. So you can talk uh, with me and discuss anything that you might need to. And what I'll try to do this semester uh, is also on Fridays and on Sundays, I'll try to uh, open it up for an open uh, online conference. So it's kind of like office hours from two to three. So basic stuff I'm sure everybody really wants to know is what is the textbook you're going to use and what are we going to do for the class? So the textbooks you're, you're going to use is just one textbook. It's called Logic and Contemporary Rhetoric. That's the 13th edition. That's what you'll be using for the rest of the semester. Now, I know people have uh, all sorts of ways of uh, getting a hold of the textbook. If you want to order from the bookstore, that's fine. Um, also, I think I put in the uh, announcements, if you went to the Canvas, that there's also an option, I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this, if you go to this website, uh, and if I didn't put it, I think I put, put it on there, but if I did, I'll put on a link uh, called Vital Source. It's a really good uh, website where you can get, uh, where you can get by ebooks for all sorts of textbooks. They have uh, ebook versions of most textbooks out there. And if you do a subscription or something, it's, it's like, it's kind of expensive for the subscription, but that means you get access to all these different books. So you might want to look into that if you're interested. If you're more traditional, you just want a hard copy book, then you're also welcome to do that as well. So basic stuff, what the assignments are going to be, and I'll come back to this, is you're going to have a couple of different things that we're going to cover and assignments that we're you're going to participate in. There is going to be a group project. I know people hate group projects. <laughs> I know it's an issue. But there also is something to learn about group projects. You have to learn how to work together. It doesn't change, trust me, even at the professional level. People still don't want to do their job in a group project. But it's something that we all have to learn and manage. So there is going to be a group project. It's not too difficult. I, I'm not trying to make anybody's life difficult here. So the group PowerPoint project is that you're going to present and create a PowerPoint uh, over a particular chapter. So I've already assigned the groups. It's already on Canvas. Uh, you can find your group. And what you're going to do is you're going to come together and you're going to present on a particular chapter. And I'll, See if I can switch over real quick and show you what that looks like. So the instructions for the group chapter are simply that you're developing a PowerPoint where you're going to cover a couple of things in the format. And this is why I created what I call a format checklist. The format checklist uh, states what should be uh, done in the assignment. So a general statement explaining the topic of the text. So, you know, what is, what is the chapter about? Give me an overview. Uh, the main points. So it doesn't have to be a huge, long PowerPoint. All it has to cover is, well, what are the main points of this chapter? Questions and answers in the clarifying and or analyzing uh, the text. So your this PowerPoint is actually going to be for your peers, for everybody else. So 
what I've had in, in previous semesters is that students will ask me, you know, uh, can I have a copy of your PowerPoint and so? But the thing is, is that you shouldn't trust my PowerPoints. I don't think you should trust anybody's PowerPoints because we're all fallible. We can all make mistakes. And that's something we'll discuss in this class about logic and rhetoric. That everybody's fallible. So if everybody's fallible, then you should look at the information, the primary source information for yourself. It's your interpretation of what they're saying in the textbook. So trust yourself. And that is a better way to learn. It's like getting somebody else's notes for, versus building your notes. Uh, somebody else might organize information differently. So this is to help you guys as well. So when you uh, create this PowerPoint, what you should do is ask questions and answer those questions. And those questions should be questions that you had yourself. So when you try to, when you're reading the textbook and you're like, I don't understand this, what is this about? And you dig a little bit deeper and you find the answer and say, oh, okay, now I get it. Those type of instances are really helpful for other students as well, because most likely other students have experienced that same question and they're confused in the same way. So that's what the power, that's one thing the PowerPoint should have. Uh, define important vocabulary terms. So you'll see a lot of new vocabulary. Philosophy is big on, on terms and jargon and so, what you want to do is make sure you define these big terms, these big words, that so and for everybody else as well, so they understand and they can use your PowerPoint as a reference later. And what I think is really helpful, and this is going to be helpful also as well, in your you're going to write two papers in this class, and we'll get to that right now. But what is really helpful in writing a paper or in doing a presentation is that you use original examples. Why? Because your examples are probably easier for other people to understand than somebody's textbook example. So you're talking to your peers. What kind of explanation, what kind of example can you provide that makes sense for your fellow peers? Not an example from the textbook because the textbook is assuming the particular audience and maybe it's assuming the wrong audience or it doesn't really identify with what you're used to. So put it in a way where it makes sense to you. So those are the things that should be uh, addressed and covered in the, in the PowerPoint presentation. How be grading the presentation once you upload the PowerPoint uh, it's based on a scale of 40 points. And what I'm looking for is based on four different criteria. So formatting, did you format it correctly? And that goes back to the, the format checklist. You have everything there that I asked for. Uh, grammar, check your grammar, spelling, is everything correct? Make sure you proofread. Uh, organization, that it, there's a clear connection between how you organize it in the chapter, that it's not all out of order or it doesn't quite make sense. Make sure that the organization is clear. And like I said, the use of your examples. You know, your original examples that you use in your presentation, you know, clear for other students, so they make sense, is it convincing? This is also part of the, the logic and rhetoric part. In order to develop a persuasive argument, you want something that's clear and for able for people able to understand right away. Questions so far? I know I've been talking super fast, but questions about the assignment. No questions? I don't have any questions. No. No? Okay. So I think it's pretty straightforward. It's it's just a PowerPoint, you're gonna work as a group and over the a particular chapter. Now the schedule's on the same paper as well. Uh, and you'll find this in a couple of different spots on Canvas, uh, either through the modules or through just clicking on assignments. There should be a link to this schedule. So group one is gonna start um, next week on the 24th. They're gonna submit a summary of chapter two and then so on 
Group two is on the 31st, they're going to submit a, a PowerPoint on chapter three, and we'll continue on like that. So just make sure you go to Canvas, find your group, and then you'll know what date it's due and who you have to work with. So let me switch back to the syllabus. So that's the that's the group PowerPoint assignment. So that's the only group assignment that you'll have. Uh, the other assignments you're going to have discussion posts almost every week. Not every week, but almost every week you're going to have a, a new discussion post. And so it'll be uh, there'll be a prompt by uh, about some part of the chapter, and you're going to develop a response to that. I have particular rules for that. So when we're talking about um, the discussion post, they should be at least three paragraphs. That should be uh, a decent sized response or post. Um, I know some people like, I'm, you know, in other classes and I've seen this in some of my classes, people try to get away with, oh, that was a really great, you know, comment or, you know, yeah, I totally agree with what the book says. That's not informative. That's not helpful. No one learned anything from that. What I want to hear is like substantial, something actually worth something in, in response. And this is what I'm looking for. At least three paragraphs where you're clarifying and, and providing a clear explanation of what's going on and why is it important and your thoughts about that. So that's a requirement that I do have for the post. They should have yeah, at least three paragraphs long. And those are already established on Canvas, so you can find uh, the discussion post. Our first discussion uh, is just an introduction. All right, so I was talking about the discussion posts. They'll be up, uh, you'll have nine discussion posts in total. And they'll be throughout the semester. And so you have about a, a week. Now, you also have to respond to people's discussion posts as well. So you have about a week between those two. So you have a week to, to respond, and you have about a week to, to post, OK? And quizzes. OK, so there will be quizzes throughout the semester. You're going to have 11 quizzes in total. Uh, so there'll be a quiz per chapter. So we're covering um, 11 chapters in the semester. And the dates are all there. They're very simple. They're multiple choice quizzes. They're 10 questions. Uh, and you'll have 15 minutes to answer the 10 questions. As well as I'm trying to be nice here, you'll have two chances to take the quiz. And I'll take the higher out of the two. So if you got a you know, 6 out of 10 the first time, and then you got a 9 out of 10 the second time, I'll take the 9 out of 10 as your final score for that quiz. Is that clear for everybody? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So all the dates are there. Uh, they open up at the same time usually. So 7 a.m. they'll open up at the beginning of the week. And then uh, towards the, the end of the week or beginning of the next week, they'll close at 11 p.m. So you have that period of time you can take the quiz any any time between those two dates. And so you can you can spread them out too. So if you want to take it the first time, let's say on the 21st or the 22nd, you can. And then later wait until the 29th or something to take it a second time, that's fine. You don't have to take them right after each other. You can spread those out if you want. And then, like I mentioned, there's going to be two papers. There's going to be a midterm paper and a final paper. And they're each going to be worth 20%. And we'll go through 
the exact instructions uh, for the midterm and the final when we get closer to those dates. Uh, but basically, you're going to create an argumentative essay, since this is logic and rhetoric. So you're going to have to take a British position on a particular issue and develop an argument for it. And let's see what else. Uh, that's, for the most part, that's what the semester is going to look like. So you can see we're going to be uh, starting next week then with chapter two of the textbook. And what I wanted to do today then, just for a little bit, uh, start covering um, chapter one so you, to give you guys an idea of what you're in for for the semester. So let me go to the PowerPoint real quick and switch. Okay, so can everybody see the PowerPoint? No. No, the PowerPoint's not coming in? No, we can't see it. Okay, let me try again. How about there? There you go. Yeah. Okay, great. So what this class is about is about developing the ability to determine good and bad reasoning. Uh, some of people think it's intuitive, like you're just born with and you just know. I'm going to disagree with that. I think uh, it's like any other skill. It takes practice and some dedication and some understanding. So I don't think it comes natural. So this is why there's a class for it, right? So in order to determine what good and bad reasoning is, looks like you have to see some examples, right? So essential ingredients the textbook talks about in identifying, you know, good and good reasons and versus bad reasons. We can be rational. That's within our capabilities, right? But then there's another level which uh, a lot of philosophers call critical reasoning. And what we want to do there is kind of just what I was talking about right now, take it to the next step from common sense or, you know, just something you're born with. Rather, it's where you start really to learn how to analyze uh, what's going on around you. So what I'll say right away is philosophers, which I've, what I've been trained in is like an engineer or a mechanic, I've learned to build arguments and take apart arguments. So just like a mechanic can build an engine and take apart an engine, they have to know every little part to it. They don't have to understand how it all works. That's the same thing for philosophers, what we do with arguments. We build arguments and we take apart other people's arguments to see how they work. But in order to do that, you have to understand that not all information, like it says, is created equal. That not all facts are just as good as other facts, or sometimes they're not even facts, right? So how do you separate good reasoning versus bad reasoning? So this is part of the terminology we're going to use for the rest of the semester. When we're talking about good reasoning, we're going to talk about cogent arguments. Something that's cogent, something that makes sense, that follows through from the premises to a conclusion, which we'll talk about in a bit. And bad reasoning, which is fallacious argument. So there's a lot of actual examples of uh, logical fallacies that we'll go over where there are mistakes in reasoning. The best, I guess the best way to explain them is like there are 
where people make these mistakes so often that we gave them names. And this has to do deeply with our psychology as well. So I'll mention that my background is not just in uh, philosophy. I also hold a degree in psychology. And so this is <laughs> the psychology is really helpful for me because you can see right away where our psychological biases, our psychological cognitive uh, defects, things, the way the, our brain works kind of holds us back sometimes from developing and seeing good reasons to adopt something or bad reasons to, to not adopt it as well. So this is a, some of the things that we'll be looking at throughout the semester. So an argument, what I was talking about right now, in a very technical sense, arguments have a particular structure to them. So when we talk about arguments, we're talking about how premises lead to a particular conclusion. So premises are the reasons that you're going to use in order to develop uh, a cogent argument for a particular conclusion. And this, you'll start to see, this is essentially what you're going to be doing uh, throughout the semester. And on the midterm and the final paper, those are what thesis papers are. If anybody has written a thesis paper, it, a thesis is essentially your conclusion to an argument. And your premises were the reasons to back it up. That was the body of the argument. So that's essentially what you're going to be doing now, is we're going to look deeply in how to construct strong premises uh, and strong argument structures to a particular conclusion. How you know it's a premise when you're reading a particular paper or something, it'll start with words like because, since, for, those are, those are indicator words. Those are clues to see, okay, these are the reasons to back up this particular argument. Now, I'll give a warning. Not all arguments, though, have these indicator words, these clues. They may not. Some premises may not start with because, since, for. But these are just good indicator words to kind of give you a hint. Okay, that's the reason they're saying this. And then the conclusion, hence, therefore, so... Um, thus, there's all these different examples of words that kind of tip you off that this is the conclusion coming up. And this is going to be really important when you start examining arguments. The conclusion might come first in somebody's argument, and then they might get into the premises, which is essentially the thesis paper again. When you start a thesis paper, you start with the conclusion. You're saying, I'll, in this paper, I'm going to prove X. And then the rest of the paper, you provide your premises, right? You give me reasons why X is true. So remember that the conclusion is not always at the end. So be careful of that. Now there's a there's exposition and argument. Anecdotes are not arguments. So if I give you a story of like, well, this happened to my uncle, or, you know, one time it was like this, that's not essentially an argument. What we're looking for a clear explanation, uh, like a clear, excuse me, not explanation, but a clear line of reasoning to a particular conclusion. So a lot of, uh, for philosophy, of course, we learn to develop arguments. Actually, Little known as mathematicians. This is an informal logic course, but I also teach formal logic. Informal logic is the type of logic mathematicians use. So we're trying to prove something. We want clear evidence for something. Also, people who will take logic with us uh, in philosophy are people who are interested in going to law school. So if you're interested in becoming a lawyer, part of becoming a lawyer is you have to develop clear arguments in the court, right? Also, you have to take this terrible test called the LSAT, which is kind of like the SAT for um, people who want to become lawyers for law school. And in that test, you're going to run into a bunch of different arguments and say, well, is this a good argument or not? And that's the kind of stuff that we're going to look at. And this is why I wanted to clarify right now. 
arguments and explanations. They're not quite the same thing as well. An explanation is a form of exposition where you're where you're just trying, you're just laying it out. But an argument, you're telling me why. So this happens a lot. I don't know if this happens to other people. <laughs> when you're, when you may be like having the discussion with a friend or a partner or a family or something, and you have to clarify, look, I'm just explaining what's going on. I'm not arguing for a particular side, right? So that's something that I've I've come through my personally right. Said I'm not arguing for them. I'm just explaining what happened. Those are two different things. So and then when we talk about winning an argument, winning an argument for us in philosophy is something very particular. It's not necessarily a disagreement. It's not a fight. It's not who yells the loudest, who, who comes off smarter. That is not what we mean by winning an argument. What we mean by winning an argument is that it, the logic is clear and persuasive. Like, I gave you a really good reasons that connect to each other to show you why it's that particular conclusion. And this is the difference between, I think, logic and rhetoric. Rhetoric, a lot of politicians use rhetoric. They try to come off uh, smart or insightful, and it's a bit of a show. This all this goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, uh, with Socrates and Plato, that you know they even identified back in the day. Politicians, you know, they're trying to get votes, so they're going to come off a certain way. They're going to try to use all these tricks to trick people into, you know, believing what they believe or whatever, but. For philosophers and what we're talking about in logic is that we don't want to simply do that. We want to actually give you good, real reasons to support something, not just to gain votes or get you on our side. That's not what we're looking for. So when we talk about cogent reasoning, good reasoning, right? We're talking about where the premises, your reasons, right? that you're giving are already known. Like you're making them explicit. They're not, you're not hiding your reasons. You're, you're clearly saying, okay, these are the reasons for this conclusion. And that, so that we can consider those reasons. So if your argument is really strong, and this is what I'm talking about, the difference between rhetoric and logic. If your arguments are really strong, your premises are there, they could stand up to criticism. You can lay out your reasons and people could try to, you know, take them down, but they can't because those reasons are really strong and they hold up. So that's the type of arguments that we want to develop are arguments where they can hold up on their own, that you don't have to hide them because those reasons are really good or, you know, try to make them sound better than they really are. They're actually strong enough to be held up on their own. And this is when we're talking about reasoning in a valid form. When we talk about validity in argument and argument structures, we're talking about how the premises connected to the conclusion, how they back the conclusion. Did one and two get you to three? You know, did this make sense in the line? Did you show all your work? And that's why I teach, like I said formal logic as well, mathematical logic. Did you show your work? Did you see, did you show how your steps lead to that particular answer? That's the kind of stuff we're looking for as well in the course. So there's two types of structures and arguments. There's deductive and inductive forms. A deductive logical form is if all the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. And you'll see deductive forms a lot in mathematics as well. This is where if all your work is correct, right, you should get the right answer. And notice this conditional statement, if and then. This is really important. Uh, I also teach computer programming as well on my, on this, on my spare time. And the same logic of what we use with computers is what we're talking about here as well. 
with if and then. Uh, an example would be like my the robot that I have in my house to clean my floors, right? My Roomba. It's been programmed to work in a way to use if and then statements. It says, well, if it hits a wall, then it's going to turn around. And that if then conditional statement is going to be really important for us throughout the semester because we're going to see a lot of that. So in mathematics and inductive reasoning, we use if and then when we say, well, if this premises is true, right? If these, like, an example would be like two plus two equals four. The first two would be one premise. The second two would be the second premise. And then the conclusion would be four, right? So if, if it's true that we have two and then it's true that we have two other things, obviously the conclusion is going to be we have four things. That's deductive valid reasoning. Inductive valid reasoning is a different type of reasoning where we have conclusions, but they go beyond what is contained in the premises. That what that means is that you're going to have to use experience to get
Uh, okay, so we'll try again. <laughs> Technology is actually terrible. It's not really that helpful. Can you guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to finish up this PowerPoint and I'll probably take the recording, edit it a little bit, so edit all the cutouts and stuff, and I'll I'll try to give it to everybody who kept you know, getting logged off and all that. But to kind of finish off the PowerPoint, two kinds of reasoning I was talking about, deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. The best way I think to characterize the two is that deductive reasoning is the kind of reasoning you'll see in mathematics, where it's, you know, if the numbers and information you're working with checks out, then you should get the right answer. Inductive reasoning is the kind of reasoning you see in science where it's going to have to come through experience, that I can't just sit there in my chair and, and reason it out. It has to come through actual experiments and outside evidence. So, for example, an ex uh, a form of deductive reasoning would be what we call modus ponens. Modus ponens is a Latin term for this type of argument structure. So if you say if A, whatever A is, then B. That's that if and then that I was talking about. So if this is true, then this is true. And two is just a reaffirmation. You're just saying, well, it isn't that true. A is true. Therefore, then B must be true. That's the conclusion. My old uh, logic professor that taught me logic uh, would use this example. He would say A stands in for it rained and B stands in for uh, the streets are wet. So if I read it with placing those inside those variables, because that's what we're using them as variables, I would say if it rains, then the streets are wet. That would be number one. Two would say, well, it did in fact rain. That's a fact. Therefore, the streets are wet. That would be B. You guys see how that follows through? From one and two, you have to get through. Now notice, with this example, if I say, if it rained, then the streets would be wet, and it did in fact rain, Notice, I don't have to use experience to know the streets are going to be wet. If one and two is true, then three has to be true. And that's by virtue of the structure itself. So it did, it's not raining anyway. Well, it's not raining right now where I'm at. But this is why it's not really important for this example. We don't have to actually talk about real rain to see that one and two has to follow, I'm oh, sorry, one and three has to follow from one and two. That if one and two is true, then three has to be true. Those are things that just by virtue of the structure of the argument. This is what we're talking about. If I have a valid structure argument, I'm talking about something like this. Now, if I'm talking about uh, inductive reasoning, then I'm talking about reasoning through experience, that I obtained these reasons not from what was presented to me, like one and two, but some new experience or some information that I got from someplace else. There's a benefit to that. The benefit is that, well, then, this is why science grows and develops. The liability to that, the con to that is that this is why science can be wrong. This is why your science textbooks change every couple of years. Whatever thesis or hypothesis or theory that they were trying to argue for, there's always a chance that it can be wrong. This is why science is never 100% right about anything. When they use inductive reasoning, 
it's a type of reasoning where you could make a mistake. So that's the liability of it. Notice mathematics is kind of fixed. If we're talking about deductive reasoning, say, well, if this is the way it is, number one is true and two is true, then it's going to follow like all the time. It doesn't matter. Like, for example, the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's not going to change. Doesn't matter 10 years from now, 20 years from now. It's been thousands of years since they developed that. It doesn't change. Science, on the other hand, does change because of this. Now, there are some wrong ideas the book talks about. I don't agree entirely with, with the book on this. When it talks about uh, cogent reasoning and some of the assumptions about cogent reasoning. Some people will argue that, well, this is not good reasoning, or my opinion is that it's not a good form of reasoning. What the book, I think, is trying to say is that good reasoning doesn't really it's not an opinion. It's not a, well, I'm going to show what I think good reasoning is. When we talk about good reasoning, we're saying it's something that we can all, that's pretty well clear if you look at it and examine it, that if A, then B, A, therefore B. Like, that's not really an issue about, you know, people's personal cultures or opinions about things. It's actually just the way that structure works on its own. This is why I talk about like with deductive reasoning using mathematics, it doesn't matter if you talk about algebra here, you talk about algebra anywhere else in the world, you know, the Pythagorean theorem is gonna be the Pythagorean theorem. It's gonna work out the way it does, regardless of how you, you know, whatever your opinion is on the Pythagorean theorem. It works in a particular way. So I think that's what the book is trying to say here. And so this is a way where this type of reason, this type of logical reason is a way that we can develop good standards where it's not a reflection of prejudice. It's not a reflection of like bias. We're trying to get away from that actually, instead of supporting that. So I think the book is just talking about situations where people say, well, this supports a particular view or bias. What we're trying to do is actually get away from that by having clear uh, reasons and well thought out premises that are, this is why I said we don't, we're not trying to hide in any information. We want to let all the information out there for people to examine and see if one falls from the other. Now there's where it discusses background beliefs as well. Background beliefs is whatever beliefs you're coming in with into the argument. Whatever you already established what your beliefs are. This is where it can be tricky because sometimes we come in with our particular beliefs and we already might have biases within those beliefs. So this is why examining your background beliefs, what you're coming into, the ideas that you already hold is important here. This is why you want to kind of be critical about your own beliefs and take for a second to kind of examine, hey, wait a minute, does this actually make sense? I've always believed this, but does this actually hold up if I think about it? So types of beliefs are beliefs about matters of fact. So, you know, you believe, I don't know, uh, the Empire State Building is X amount of feet high, and then you turn out to be like, oh, it's not. Uh, beliefs about values. So beliefs about values are a little bit more trickier, like what you believe is right or wrong, what you believe is uh, a good thing for people to do versus a bad thing, what you believe about immigration, or um, is, it, is there something wrong with Illegal immigration or something like that. Those are value beliefs. Those are things that you would question about your value. The example here that we use is capital punishment. Do you believe capital punishment is justified or not? Those are the type of value beliefs. So I teach ethics as well. And this is something that we talk about when we talk about belief systems.
And then when we talk about worldviews or philosophies, we talk about not just our particular views, but how our friends, families, our culture influences these views. Those are things that we should examine as well. So you might be brought up to believe a particular thing, you know, most of your life, and then find out, well, wait a minute, maybe like that sort of self question, well, perhaps this isn't the right way, even though I was brought up this way. Maybe if I, you know, start looking at, are there actually good reasons, good premises to support these beliefs? And this is hard to change though. So at least the book is being honest about this. The kind of beliefs that you're born with and you're kind of instilled at a young age are really hard to change, to deeply ingrained. And psychologically, this is why we have a lot of biases that we don't want to, once we have a belief system in there, once we accept particular beliefs, we're very reluctant in changing those beliefs. We don't want to change. We don't like change too much. So those are things that we should consider. Now, insufficiently grounded beliefs are just was that we didn't have good reasons to support, that we didn't really think about. You just believe, well, yeah, it's true, but you never stopped and question, well, wait a minute, do I have good support for this belief? Have people given me actual good reasons for this or did I just accept this? It's like, oh yeah, obviously. So those are what we call insufficient grounded beliefs. So what we should look for and these type of beliefs are consistency and believability. This is what I was talking about. Is it really believable? Does this really make sense? If you still believe in Santa Claus, right? It's a silly example. You know, does that really make sense? Is there a consistency? I think this is what children are able to do early on, right? They can start putting together, wait a minute, if this is really true, Santa Claus is really true, well then shouldn't everybody get gifts? This is a question I had as a kid, right? Like, well, why do some people not get gifts at all? And you say, well, because they're bad. And you say, well, wait a minute. I don't, they weren't bad. There doesn't seem to be a good reason. Maybe some people just couldn't afford gifts, right? So you start to kind of question those types of consistencies. This is really important. And Socrates is famous for saying the unexamined life is not worth living. So you kind of just go along with it and say, well, this makes sense to me. I don't need to believe anything else or I don't need to question my beliefs. Uh, Socrates was famous for saying that because he's saying, well, then, you know, what's your life worth? Then? What's the life? If you're not questioning the value of your life, you're not questioning the worth of your life, then why are you living? Like, what is, what is the purpose? If you're not examining the purpose of your life, then it seems kind of empty. It's just like you live, you die, okay, but where's the greater meaning to it? So background beliefs primarily can be classified as two main categories, the nature of the nature of human nature, like I said, human beings, we have particular biases, particular ways our psychology works, and the reliability of information. What kind of information do we get? Who told us this information about Santa Claus, for example? Things like that. Now, this is where I kind of disagree with the book as well. You say, well, science is going to give us good reasons. And I'm not saying science doesn't give us some good reasons for some things. But like I said, science is also fallible. It could be wrong. This is why we change our textbooks, right? So I think science is a good way to start, but it shouldn't be the end. So there's some things that science can't do, like establishing the validity of mathematics. That's deductive reasoning. So there's two types of reasoning we talked about. Remember, deductive and inductive. So science can't really say much about deductive reasoning. They can say a lot about inductive reasoning. So science has some limits though. It's not perfect. I think that's just an overview. That's the basics for chapter one. 
to kind of give you guys an idea of what's coming up. So what we're going to do next week is we're going to start getting into the details of the difference between what I started talking about with deductive uh, valid reasoning and inductive valid reasoning. So we'll stop there for today. Any final questions? No, no questions. Nothing. Okay, so 